you will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions based on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to Section 1. Section 1. You will hear a conversation between a police officer and a crime victim. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good afternoon, Sussex Constabulary, PC Browning speaking. Good afternoon. I would like to report a theft. Right, madam. First I need to get your details before we can proceed. Fine. Go ahead. The crime is theft. So, you write T-H-E-F t in the space provided you should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time listen carefully and answer questions one to three good afternoon sussex constabulary pc browning speaking good afternoon i would like to report a theft right madam first i need to get your details before we can proceed fine go ahead could you give me your first name and surname please Yes, it's Mary Tyndale. Could you spell your surname, please? Yes, it's T-I, that's I, not Y, N-D-A-L-E. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Was that an N or an M you said? I know, the line's not good. I said N, not M. OK. And your home address and postcode? Four... Larch Avenue, Park Road, Swindon. Sorry, you said 4 Larch Avenue, as in L-A-R-C-H? Yes, and the postcode is FN1SW19. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. OK, that's fine. Now you said you would like to report a theft. Yes, my handbag was stolen this morning. Can you describe your handbag? Well, it's quite an ordinary white leather bag with two black leather handles. Oh, and a black shoulder strap too. Any other features you could describe? It's quite plain. There isn't any picture or design on the front. There's also a zip fastener on the top. How about the contents? Did you have any valuables in it? Luckily, no. I left my iPad at home, along with my mobile. I'm quite forgetful sometimes. I had a purse in it, though, with a small amount of money, as well as my driving licence. My keys and personal items and so on, I always keep about me in my coat pocket. OK, that's fine. All I need to have is your phone number or other contact number. My mobile number is 07900381988. Sorry, was that double eight at the end? Yes, that's right. Thank you. That's all I need for now. You need a crime number. OK, I'll just get a pen. Ready? Go ahead. So, it's T K. 34S5899. 
We'll contact you within the week to give you an update. Thank you, officer. That's the end of section one. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear an interview with John Whiting, reviewing prison systems in America past and present. First, you will have time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Today the prison system is in crisis. Disorder and violence are the norm in many prisons. With us today is John Whiting to talk about how history could teach us a few things about running prisons more effectively and at less cost to the taxpayer. So, John, tell us a bit more about the lessons we could learn from the past. Well, today we see prisoners behaving aggressively towards prison guards who themselves struggle to maintain discipline in prisons. We are giving prisoners too many rights. Maybe we need to adopt the prison systems used in past times to maintain better control in prisons. For one thing, prison systems in the past could definitely teach us about how to better control prisoners with fewer guards. I know it sounds too good to be true and a bit of a contradiction in terms, but certain prison designs from the past have done exactly this. In fact, it was in the 18th century that the design for the first really effective prison was thought of. Even today the design is far superior to any modern prison building. The design was the idea of philosopher and social realist Jeremy Bentham. Named the panopticon after the Greek pan meaning all and opticon seeing, the design allowed a single guard to watch many prisoners at the same time. It was an amazingly clever invention. Bentham's design had the form of a central guard tower around which the prison cells were grouped in a circular fashion, facing inwards towards the tower. Seen from a bird's eye view, the design resembled a giant pie cut into segments, each triangular segment being an individual prison cell, with the watchtower at the centre. What made this design so clever was the fact that only one guard was needed to watch all the prisoners. As a result, a fewer guards were needed, reducing cost and manpower. It also had the effect of making prisoners behave better. This was because whilst the guard could in theory see all the prisoners at any one time, they could not see him, due to the way the prison was designed. So manpower could be reduced to almost zero at times, if the guard wanted to take a break, as his prisoners would never realise they weren't being watched. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Although Bentham's idea was never put into practice in his lifetime, in later years a very similar design was patented by William H. Brown and Benjamin Hall in 1881. One of these, the Squirrel Cage, in Pottawatomie County, only closed in 1969. It was one of three prisons designed by Brown and Hall. Each had the unusual feature of revolving prison cells that moved around a central tower, like a wheel revolving on its axis. Bearing an obvious similarity to Bentham's panopticon, the cells within the wheel-like structure were all also triangular in shape, 
Brown and Hall's designs ensured that no personal contact between prisoner and jailers was necessary. However, they also allowed maximum security with minimum jailer attention, just like Bentham's original panopticon design, in fact. The main difference between the three prison designs was in their size. The Pottawatomie County Jail was constructed on three floors, whilst the Crawfordsville Jail in Indiana was a two-storey prison and the Gallatin, Missouri Jail only a one-storey prison. The Pottawatomie County Jail also had some extra buildings outside the perimeter of the prison cells. These buildings included the kitchen, jailer's accommodation, as well as cells for female prisoners and more trusted inmates. All buildings now are disused as jails and they function as museums to those interested in history and the purely curious. Any modern day visitor can now see firsthand the signatures and dates of many of the prison's infamous prisoners which are carved into the prison walls. They can also marvel at the ingenuity of prison buildings that have never been equalled in practicality and design since they were first constructed over 100 years ago. In complete contrast to the preceding prison designs is the contemporary architecture of Norway's Halden prison. This, for me, exemplifies what is wrong with prisons today. More reminiscent of a holiday camp than a place of incarceration, Holden's prison buildings are surrounded by attractively landscaped areas. The idea is to provide a relaxing environment, but it seems that the architects forgot that prison is meant to punish prisoners, not to provide them with recreational facilities. I believe that the lenience exhibited towards prisoners today and the privileges that they enjoy are contributing to the disorder that we now see in prisons. Architects need to look to past prison designs for inspiration, not holiday brochures for luxury hotels. That's the end of section two. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a discussion between two students of criminology and their lecturer. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. That was a really fascinating lecture. If a bit gruesome. Well, the Ratcliffe murders of 1811 certainly had a significant impact on the English society at the time. It wasn't just the fact that innocent parties were involved or that two households were brutally murdered that provoked public outrage and hysteria. The murderer, or murderers, since they may, as you know, have been an accomplice, invaded the sanctity of their victims' homes to commit truly horrendous crimes. An Englishman's home is his castle, right? So I guess no one felt truly safe in the comfort of their own home after that. Exactly. That's also why burglaries, too, have such a profound effect on their victims. It's often not the loss of valuables or possessions or even the inconvenience that upsets a victim most, but the fact that their conviction of being safe in their own home has been severely compromised. But public hysteria broke out too, didn't it? Because there was a feeling that public safety was under threat. It was felt that the localised police forces at the time were inadequate. Very true. The police force at the time had limited power. They could enforce the rulings of a local magistrate for the county, but they had one huge disadvantage. There was no communication between county police forces, was there? Yes. Details of crimes committed within a county were not shared. Obviously, when a criminal crossed county borders, they could often successfully evade capture. 
Today, that seems so absurd. Nowadays, with information instantly accessible to all police forces nationally and worldwide on police computer systems, yes, it does. But don't forget that it was only with the formation of London's Metropolitan Police Force in 1829 by Sir Robert Peel that criminal records could begin to be consolidated on a national basis. Even then, some areas outside and even within the Metropolitan Police District remained beyond the jurisdiction of the Metropolitan Police Force. Were the Ratcliffe murders a bit of a wake-up call then to the crime-fighting forces of the time? More than that, they acted as a catalyst in the formation of the Metropolitan Police. The public, too, played no small part in bringing about the much-needed shake-up in the policing systems of the era. So the Metropolitan Force was founded over half a century before the infamous Jack the Ripper murders? Yes. However, in spite of the Force's best efforts, the Ripper remained at large. Many suspects were put forward, though, ranging from children's author Lewis Carroll through to artist Walter Sickert. Despite the notable failure to deliver justice on this occasion, the Metropolitan Police Force could not be blamed for any inadequacies in police procedure. In fact, the creation of the Metropolitan Police Force was a turning point in English law-keeping. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. So once the public got what they wanted, an organised police force, were they happy? One would imagine that that would have been the case. However, the public in fact showed a resentment towards the new law enforcers. Really? Yes, so much so that the public gave them derogatory names like peelers and bobbies. Nicknames derived from the name of the Metropolitan Force's founder, Sir Robert Peel. I guess not many people would have wanted to work for the Metropolitan Police then. Well, at least it was full-time paid work. In fact, policing only first became a permanent full-time profession with the advent of Henry Fielding. He formed a force armed with pistols, known as the Bow Street Runners, in 1749, answerable to and paid by a magistrate's office. Prior to that, policing had relied on unpaid night watchmen and constables working for a particular parish. Male householders were chosen for the jobs of watchman or constable, working by rotation or appointment. Armed with no more than a cane, the watchmen were a poor match for the criminals of the day, as were the constables, who were similarly ill-equipped. Those appointed as watchmen or constables, not surprisingly, lacked enthusiasm for their task, which had to be combined with their normal daytime employment. So, did the Metropolitan Police Force operate a tough selection process for employing officers? There were the same conditions for a certain height and fitness level as in contemporary police forces. But when new recruits entered the force, they had to work their way up from the bottom. No concessions were made for class or background. This still holds true today. That's the end of section 3. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a recording describing a trial courtroom and the conduct of legal trials. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Although variations occur in courtroom layouts, this is a description of a standard UK trial courtroom. In a trial courtroom, the judge is invariably seated behind an elevated desk or bench. Adjacent to the bench are the witness stand and a section that is slightly larger to accommodate the court reporter. Behind the court reporter, the bailiff stands against the wall of the courtroom throughout the proceedings. His job is to ensure the court procedure is observed and order is maintained. Directly in front of the judge's bench, located in the central courtroom area known as the well, is a table where the court clerk sits and records court proceedings. Only the bailiff is authorised to cross the well during a court session, to transfer documents between the lawyers and the judge. Any unauthorised crossing of the well is regarded as being extremely disrespectful to the court and is usually expressly forbidden. Off to one side of the clerk's desk is located a table where the defendant and his lawyer are seated. The defendant, also known as the accused, works closely with his lawyer, who is also termed the lawyer for the defence. Across the other side of the courtroom, the lawyer for the prosecution sits with the plaintiff, who is bringing the case against the defendant to court. Close by is the jury box that covers the largest area in the courtroom. It holds 12 members of the public who are responsible for delivering the final verdict on the defendant. All those who are actively involved in court proceedings are in the area of the courtroom termed the bar. Behind the area of the bar is the gallery which seats spectators, who may be relatives of those involved in the court hearing, or merely curious members of the public. The bar itself may be an actual physical barrier, such as a railing, or merely a designated area. Apart from the parties to the case and any witnesses, only the lawyers can literally pass the bar. Court personnel and jury members usually enter through separate doors behind the bench. And this is why the term the bar has come to refer to the legal profession as a whole. So that is the court set up. Now on to how the verdict is arrived at and sentence proclaimed by the judge. When all evidence has been given and challenged by both the lawyer for the prosecution and the lawyer for the defence, then the process of reaching a verdict can begin. Prior to the judge's summing up the case, it is normal court procedure for the judge to meet with both lawyers first. In the meeting, what the judge will say is determined by mutual consent between the lawyers and the judge. It is then up to the judge to decide if the summing up will be split into two parts. If this course of action is taken, the summing up will be divided into a legal part and a summary of the facts of the case. The legal part is basically a clarification of what the charge is, and what has to be proven, in addition to any special directives for the case, such as the need to respect confidentiality. The summary is given to ensure that all members of the jury are reminded of the essential facts of the case. It is an impartial summary of all the evidence heard during the trial by the jury. After the summing up, the judge will stress the importance of reaching a unanimous verdict. The jury will then retire to consider their decision. If the case is particularly complex, the judge will first issue the jury with a written document, entitled A Route to Verdict. This is essentially a series of questions the jury should pose themselves whilst considering the verdict. The time taken for a jury to reach a verdict can vary from a few hours to several days. If there is a chance that the verdict will not be reached before the end of the court day, then members of the jury are free to go home, on the proviso that they will not discuss details of the case with anyone outside the courtroom. The more serious the case, 
the longer a jury may take to reach a decision. If the jury continues to struggle to reach a verdict, the judge will deliver a Watson direction, which is also known as a give-and-take direction. Essentially, this is a directive reminding the jury of their oath and to maintain unbiased views whilst discussing the verdict. Should the jury not be unanimous in their decision, then a majority verdict is permitted. Once the verdict has been delivered, the sentencing of the accused is left entirely to the judge. The jury is, however, permitted beforehand to influence the judge sentencing in order to make it more lenient. Accordingly, a recommendation of mercy is added to the jury verdict. Whether the judge takes this into account is entirely up to them. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer.